And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I'm Janice Kamina Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc., I welcome you to tonight's program. A special welcome, as well as a thank you to the outstanding Ron Brownstein and Pat Morrison. We have what will surely be a disturbing and challenging and threatening political year we are heading into. We are hoping that by staying well informed by smart experts like, like tonight's guest, we will all be better equipped to weather the upcoming storm. Thank you both for sharing your br brilliance with us. As we head into this July 4th holiday, it is almost too obvious for us to all be reminded of what motivated us to begin this extraordinary weekly series now in its 161st week. Wow. We remain committed to being as engaged and informed as possible uh, and to bringing the highest quality programming to our audience, programming designed to ensure that we are prepared to advocate for our democracy and encourage informed and enlightened civic participation. Hope you will all enjoy the holiday with family and friends. Next week's topic could not be timelier, both in terms of the principles of our American democracy and in terms of this week's very important US Supreme Court decision in Moore versus Harper on voting rights. We will welcome one of the country's most respected election law and voting rights mavens, UCLA law professor Rick Hassan. He will be in conversation with the always extraordinary Pat Morrison and it feels like the timing gods were definitely on our side this week with the selection of that program for next week. The following week on July 12th, we will welcome the New York Times Jerusalem reporter, Isabel Kirshner, who will be in conversation with former two-time US ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk. They will be discussing Kirshner's recently released book, Israel, the Land of Hope and Fear, the Battle for Israel's Inner Soul. It is also sure to be an extraordinary hour. Now for a few more announcements, my colleague and friend, David Lehrer. David? Thank you, Janet. It's a pleasure to be joining everyone from Brooklyn, New York, where I'm visiting with family. After the programs that Janet just mentioned, we'll spend July 19th with two of the sharpest and wittiest political analysts around, Mike Murphy and Bob Schrump. Both have distinguished careers as practitioners of the dark art of politics, with clients ranging from John McCain for Murphy to Al Gore for Trump, and both have become highly regarded analysts of the present political scene and a model of bipartisan collegiality. They're both affiliated with the Center for the Political Future at the University of Southern California. Larry Mantle will moderate. The following week, we welcome New York Times op-ed columnist Michelle Goldberg, who returns to dialogue with Warren Only. Goldberg, who was last with us in 2021, is almost always provocative and smart, and she's been with the Times since 2017. I have the pleasure of once again introducing one of our most frequent moderators who can discuss politics, the arts, literature, and history in one discussion without skipping a beat. She's a terrific moderator and a delight to work with LA Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, Pat Morrison. Pat? <clears throat> David, thank you. And thanks to all the people who are watching this series and getting so much out of it. And to the people and the organizations that support and sponsor what it is that we do here in the hopes that it will make better citizens, better people of all of us. So thank you for that. Um, my guest tonight is Ron Brownstein, my former LA Times colleague, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, the senior editor at The Atlantic, where you can read his work, a senior CNN political analyst and author of the great, not entirely off-topic bestseller, mm. <laughs> Rock Me on the Water, about politics, music, the arts and culture, in Los Angeles canyons of the uh, the creative canyons of the 1970s. Ron, it's a pleasure to talk to you as always. That's so good to be with you. I mean, how do we sneak in with that uh, that that lineup that's coming? But I'm glad to be, <laughs> you know, always, always happy to be part of this. Well, we're talking about this as the 16 months out from the mm -hmm. election, but really, of course, as you know, we live in the permanent campaign. And we're going to be talking, among other things, um, about how we can discern in the months to come what the polls mean, not the numbers, but whether or not a poll is legitimate, whether it's a push poll and is trying to get results rather than just looking at results and, and how people can recognize good polls from bad polls. So we'll be getting to that in a minute. Okay. But I think first people are very acutely aware of what's been happening with Donald Trump, with the indictments, with the tape that CNN found and released of him evidently, in his own words, expressing with bravado his attitude and knowledge about declassifying documents as president and as ex-president. 
Yeah, uh, you know, th this, this classified documents case uh, is, you know, I, I don't often say this, but exactly as Bill Barr said, such a uh, remarkably self-inflicted wound uh, by Trump, uh, pretty clear from the indictment that, you know, they did not charge him for anything that he gave back, right? I mean, he, th 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 this all could have been avoided, but to me, it is the culmination, not only of his public life, but his private life as well. I mean, this is someone who has operated his entire life by the belief that his money meant that rules didn't apply to him, that, that he, could, he could bully and spend and lawyer his way out of anything. And, uh, you know, we'll see. He might be right again, you know, with the judge that has been assigned to the case and the prospect of, you know, lengthy appeals. Um, but he has now run up against a bigger force than he's ever faced before in an indictment from the Justice Department. And it is highly unlikely to be the last indictment. I think, you know, it is considered virtually certain that Fulton County, Georgia is going to indict him. And I know it goes back and forth, but I think the needle is again tilting toward the belief that the Justice Department will indict him as well over January 6th. So Trump's lifelong belief that with enough money and enough power, you can get away with anything, a view famously expressed um, perhaps more um, graphically in the um, uh, Access Hollywood tape, uh, is going to be tested, I think, in the in the in the years ahead. I think it's enough money, enough power, and enough BS too, because there is a core constituency still. It may or may not be eroding for Trump. There is a solid. What's the percentage of people who would, in fact, vote for him if he shot somebody on Fifth Avenue? Um, so let's see. I would say his absolutely unshakable base is somewhere between thirty-five and forty percent of the Republican Party which is probably only 20% of the overall country. Um, but once you are the Republican nominee, there are a lot more people who are gonna vote for you, even if they you know, are whatever doubts they have about you. And that's part of the, the challenge um, in terms of people who are worried about kind of the, the future of democracy. I mean, there are uh, uh, roughly three quarters of Republicans, let's, let, let's break it down. There are roughly three quarters of Republicans are sympathetic to Trump's claim that the election was stolen, okay? And uh, roughly three quarters of Republicans think his presidency was a success. Uh, roughly three quarters of Republicans have a favorable uh, view of him. There's roughly a quarter of the party that is fundamentally alienated from him. But if he is the Republican nominee, it's not clear at all how many of those people would, you know, would actually vote for a Democrat or potentially not vote. Part of the reason uh, Trump uh, has so much leverage in American society overall is because the Republican voters who say they disapprove of almost everything about him and even might agree that his actions have been a threat to democracy still say they would vote for him. I mean, you, we see this from elected officials. I mean, uh, you know, there are some of the people who are the most critical of him, you know, will still say if he's the Republican nominee, I will vote for him. So it's not really clear exactly what that criticism, you know, in some cases, um, in some cases mean, but, but he has, I think he has a, a hold, if we're thinking about it in a primary context against other Republicans, he's polling now at an incredibly high number, over 50% in national polls, which very few candidates in either party have ever reached uh, in, in a primary the summer before the voting began in Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, uh, but that not all of that, you know, that 50% is not all created equal. And I would say somewhere between 35 and 40% of the Republican Party is going to stick with him no matter what. And the challenge for the other candidates is in a multi-candidate field, that can be plenty to win. Just reminding the audience that in 2016, Trump did not reach 50% of the vote in any Republican primary until his home state of New York in late April, at which point he had effectively clinched the nomination already. At that point, by the point he was the uh, presumptive nominee, his total share of the vote was only 40%. So 40% is a lot to get past. Well, let's make a distinction between the voters who set aside his potential criminal responsibility and like him for who he is, like him for going in and, and mm -hmm. saying whatever comes to his mind, and the Republican leadership which would really, really, really wish that somebody would come along and take Donald Trump out of the equation politically. You have Kevin McCarthy, the speaker, 
who said something as mild as, well, she, you know, it's open question whether or not he could win the general election and ended up once again having to back away from that and apologize. So the political leaders are afraid while the Trump core is enthusiastic. And, you know, as I have the phrase I've used is that Republican leaders have stitched their own straitjacket here. OK, because they are basically saying that we can't afford to say in public what we believe privately about Trump because the base, you know, the base will rise up and smite us uh, and the base is still with him. Well, one of the reasons, one of the key reasons the base is still with him so unequivocally is that no one they trust, no voice they trust will make a case against Trump. Uh, in, in, um, uh, that might be persuasive to them. Um, you know, we do now have a number of former national security officials for Trump who have publicly said they consider him unfit to be president, right? I mean, you have John Bolton, you have Mark Esper, certainly Mattis, certainly John Kelly, Barr, if you want to include the attorney general in that kind of general rubric, and in particular saying his behavior in this classified documents case is disqualifying. It disqualifies him from someone that you should trust to be president again. That, um, I do believe that that could become an important uh, nexus of thought uh, if he wins the nomination. But the fact that you don't have Republican senators in any large numbers, much less Republican House members, out there saying that, and certainly the conservative media ecosystem is overwhelmingly tilted toward the voices that are supportive of Trump. Um, you know, uh, maybe the Trump, maybe the uh, a majority of the Republican Party would stay with him no matter what, but we don't really know because they're not. It's not being tested. I mean, they're not getting. Fox is not letting that message through very much, although they do let it through some. And in particular, you know, someone like Mitch McConnell. The most he will do when McCarthy and the, Jim Jordan and everyone else goes out and says this is all political, inherently illegitimate, all of these indictments, you don't have McConnell going out saying, no, no, that's not right. I mean, let's let the process play out. The most he will do is not echo that. And that's the imbalance you have in the Republican Party. There are a few, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchinson, an occasional senator who will say, we have to let the process play out, but mostly, in the Republican universe, the Trump defenders are vitriolic, you know, blanketing the airwaves, and those that are skeptical mostly just bite their lip. That's the most they will do. I want to remind everybody who's watching that you can pose a question for Ron in the chat uh, that you see there at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to some of your questions a little later in the program. Uh, so let's let's talk about polls then and give a little bit of a tutorial for people about mm -hmm how to discern good ones and bad ones. Because you know people think of polls as push the button, I'm in favor or I'm against, but polls are very scientifically constructed, demographically, structurally sound to represent a certain sampling of the voters. And that takes money and that takes time. So what, what are the red flags for people to look for when it comes to bad polls and where should they look for good polling? Yeah, you know, look, there's it, it no question that, it, that the, Trump's ascent in particular has made it tougher for polling. Um, uh, you know, if you go back over these last few elections, there were uh, more inaccuracy in polls when Trump is on the ballot than when he's not. I think 2018 and 2022 were probably better than 2020 or certainly 2016. Um, you know, the question of whether, I mean, the, the big question in the Trump era that everybody has been focused on are, do polls capture enough of the non-college white voters who love Trump, but essentially at this point, most of them distrust every institution in American life. You know, you pick your institution and they distrust it and thus are less likely to participate in polls. And pollsters have done a lot of work to try to, to try to, you know, different mechanisms to compensate for that. They've also had to simultaneously adjust to a world where a lot, most, many people, especially young people, they don't have landlines anymore. You've got to figure out how to reach them. Um, there's a lot of hybrid methodologies. One of the most respected polls, uh, um, state polls, the Marquette University Law School poll in Wisconsin unveiled a new methodology today that blended some online work uh, with some cell phone work. Um, 
no one has this entirely figured out. And it is possible that, um, uh, you know, if Trump is the nominee, particularly in these heavily white non-college states of the Rust Belt, polls may understate his support to some extent. Um, I think the best thing people can do is trust the, you know, in this case, it really is trust the brand names. The averages I feel are worse than, than useless. Like 538. Uh, five, we'll come, come back to that. The two main averages are 538.com and realclearpolitics.com. Real Clear Politics is not playing it straight. They are a fundamentally, even though they don't wear the label, they are fundamentally a Republican advocacy website. And they load up their polls. Uh, their averages to make it look better for Republicans. I mean, they had Patty Murray and Michael Bennett in toss-up races, you know, uh, in 2022, and they each won by like 15 points because they they threw in all of these uh, partisan Republican polls that are produced just to game the averages and to change the the media dialogue in a way that they hope will affect turnout and just you know campaign contributions uh, and everything else. Uh, Ron, let me interrupt. One, let me interrupt one second. I yeah. need to correct myself. You can put your questions for Ron in the Q and A box, not the chat box. So oh. go to the Q and A box with your questions for Ron. That, Sorry to interrupt, the, Ron. Yeah, that's the chat box, not the chat bot. The, not the chat bot. No. By, by 2024, the chat bot will be having this conversation with you, or maybe it'll be having oh, both ends of this. Yes, yeah, so it'll take both sides. It'll take both sides by then. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad to you know we're in the waning hours of content providers, even you know, um, uh, or or, or uh, a carbon-based uh, content providers. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think in this, there's, I, I can't point to like any one methodology that I feel is, you know, uniquely better than the others. And to some extent, like I just go with the, the you know, the brand names that actually are seriously trying to make this work, you know, and, uh, and that's the, uh, what used to be the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, now they're separate polls. The NBC poll is done by uh, a Republican Democratic team. The Wall Street Journal poll now is done by a different Republican Democratic team. The ABC Washington Post poll is generally pretty good. The CNN poll is pretty good. The Fox poll is, you know, generally pretty good. Um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, Gallup doesn't really do horse race polling, but it's, um, it's presidential approval, I think, has the longest track record going back to the 40s. Uh, it's something that you can you can compare. Um, you know, you basically you want to look under the hood and you want a poll that is, uh, you know, the, the red flags are when the distributions of the groups are out of whack. What does that mean? Well, like, you know, we know that roughly somewhere around 68, 70 percent of the voters will be white. Um, maybe maybe a point or two less than that. We know that of the white, in 2024, I'm saying of the white voters, probably somewhere around 38 to 40% are gonna be uh, non-college whites and somewhere around 30 to 32% are gonna be college whites and roughly 32% of the electorate, give or take a point, I would say up, are, are gonna be people of color. And your, your poll, your national poll should look something like that. If, they, if you get a national poll that's 76% white, it ain't telling you much, you know? I mean. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the long-term trajectory, like the long-term trajectory in the composition of the electorate is sort of like a glacier. It doesn't like sneak up on anybody, you know? I mean, you kind of know what it is and it doesn't leap around that much either. Uh, you know, the, the take, to take the best example, the, the share of the total vote cast by by voters who are white people without a college degree. And those are the voters who become the foundation of the Republican coalition. That has declined two to three points in every election since 1976. Mm. Like every four years, it goes down two to three points. Uh, even under Trump, where turnout among that group went up, their share of the electorate still went down because their share of the overall population is going down. So, you know, I, you gotta look for things like that, but I, the, the easiest user guide is like, there are a few brand names that are good and and I would trust them, you okay. know? Let's, yeah. But so in that context, there are a couple of polling numbers that have come out. This yeah. week. One of them shows that Biden and Trump are neck and neck in Pennsylvania, um, which I guess is kind of mind boggling. Um, the, the idea that uh, it's 71, 72% 
of voters, even though they may not like Trump, think that the indictments are politically motivated. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. getting numbers as high as 20%, like whether he's the Ralph Nader or the Ross Perot of the Democratic field. Uh, by seven to one, American Jews tend to support Biden uh, over any Republican challenger. And that, of course, excludes uh, the polling of the Orthodox community. Um, so, so what are these polls? If you take them seriously, if these are good polls, yeah. what are they saying? Uh, well, you got the whole landscape there. So basically, what is, what is, what is, the, uh, what is the status of American public opinion? Uh, first, um, the majority of Americans, especially outside of the Republican coalition, are responding to these indictments as you would expect, um, which it, to, to wit, they do not view them as a calling card for four more years in the White House. And this is a big challenge for Republicans in the gap between how inside this is viewed inside the coalition and how it's viewed outside the coalition. The question on whether you view it as political, I think is really um, not that informative because Americans think everything that politicians do is political, okay? It's not like, you know, if you ask- What we're talking about, it, you what, know- What I'm gonna say, what, what's, more important, what's more important is that consistently a majority of the country, especially a majority outside the Republican coalition, thinks the indictments were justified, thinks that Trump and, and uh, Trump endangered national security. Those are the politically relevant numbers here. Um, and um, the, the the thought that people see it as political doesn't really, I, I don't, I personally, I mean, they, they think that about, people think that about everything. They think politicians are mendacious and self, self-interested and so forth. And so, but that doesn't mean they don't think it's justified or that it's, that, that it's a serious uh, allegation uh, against Trump. So take all these other polls, like the, the, the Quinnipiac poll that you cite that had Trump up one today uh, in Pennsylvania came out the same day that the Marquette University Law School poll came out and had Trump minus nine in Wisconsin. Both of those things are not true. Like they, they that, that there's no way that there's gonna be a 10 point gap between Wisconsin and Pennsylvania on election day with Wisconsin more dem, more blue than Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is more blue than, than Wisconsin. So like, where are we uh, overall? So maybe I should just kind of try where we are overall. And it also answers the Robert Kennedy. Um, We've got a situation where the two, the leading candidates in each party are both facing enormous headwinds, okay? Biden's approval rating went under 50% around the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And even though I think most analysts would agree he's been a more successful president than many expected, certainly more than I've expected, uh, he's gotten an, a lot done legislatively. He's been very deft in managing foreign policy, which you might've more anticipated, but his approval rating has stayed under 50, well under 50. It's now closer to 40 probably than 45. Um, and those are ominous numbers for an incumbent. And there are probably two principal reasons why it's so low, well, three. Uh, the generic one is that the ceiling for any president is much lower than it used to be because the ability to get the other party to say they approve of you has like basically gone down to virtually nothing. You know, it used to, I mean, Eisenhower and Kennedy had majority approval from the other party, but even as late as Reagan and I believe Clinton, it could get to 15 or 20, now it's five. So the, the number to start is lower. But the, the other reasons why Biden's approval is low is that um, Americans are very down on the economy, primarily because of inflation. They're probably more down than objective conditions would um, justify, except the way they're, processing it is they, many people do not feel their paycheck is keeping up with the cost of daily life. And then the other thing that is keeping down his approval rating is the broad perception, which I think is the part that is freaking out democratic strategists the most, that, that it just doesn't improve, the broad perception that he's not physically and mentally up to doing this for four more years. I mean, like that's a big number and it is a big number even among Democrats, maybe a third of Democrats, uh, say that, which is, by the way, the answer to the Robert Kennedy question. It's not, you know, doesn't have much to do with Robert Kennedy. It has to do with there are a solid minority of Democrats who don't want Biden to run again, um, and that's going to find some kind of expression. You know, but a guy who takes off his shirt and denies the efficacy of vaccines. Yeah, because they don't. It's like I don't. They were, you know, it, it, his numbers. Like if if somebody wants to spend money explaining who Robert Kennedy is, his numbers will go down. Um, you know, there's no appeal in the Democratic Party for anything that he's offering. What there is in the Democratic Party is a substantial portion that doesn't want Biden to run again. 
And the best way they can express that is by voting for someone else in the primary. Well, but then is he a spoiler or will the Democrats express their unhappiness with Biden in the primary and get into line for the general election, which doesn't seem always to have been the case in the past, but who knows now? Right. So uh, they will mostly get in line for the election, but especially if it's Trump. Uh, but there is the risk that as in 2016, there are third party candidates who could peel away younger voters in particular who are really down on Biden. They were never enthusiastic about him and his approval rating among them is staggeringly low. Okay, but let me get to the whole but here because all this is you know, normally everything we've been talking about, the share of people who disapprove of his performance, the share of people who say he shouldn't run again, the share of people who say he's too old for the job and the share of people who are down in the economy, these would all be red lights blinking on the dashboard and you would, as Bob Shrum did in 1980, be writing speeches for someone to run against the sitting president, right? I mean, Shrum was the, the great wordsmith for Teddy Kennedy. Um, but why aren't Democrats freaking? I mean, Democrats are nervous about some of these numbers, I think, particularly the, the majority that say he's too old to do this for four more years and maybe even too old to do it now. Um, uh, but why are they not freaking out about this? They're not freaking out about this and not jumping out of windows and Gavin Newsom and Gretchen Whitmer have not even made a perfunctory visit to New Hampshire and Iowa and South Carolina because all of these conditions, Pat, were also present in 2022 and Democrats did unexpectedly and ahistorically well. Um, Biden's approval rating in the national exit poll was 45%. His approval rating was under 50 in all of the key swing states. In all of the key swing states that asked the question, two thirds or more said they did not want him to run again. And in all of those states, 75% or more of voters described the economy in negative terms. It wasn't like in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona, and Georgia, people were uniquely more satisfied with the way things were going than everywhere else. They were equally unsatisfied. And yet Democrats, with the exception of Stacey Abrams and Mandela Barnes, won all of the key statewide races in those five states, which are the ones that will pick the next president, uh, maybe plus Nevada, um, because even voters who were disenchanted with Biden or down on the economy, it, 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 a historically high percentage of them voted for Democrats anyway, because they consider the Republican alternative too extreme, unacceptable on abortion and a threat to democracy. And that is the exact precedent that Democrats are counting on in 2024. It may be harder to do, but Biden, you know, to, to look at this very technically, the reason why Democrats did so well in 2022 is that they won a plurality of voters who said they somewhat disapproved of Biden's performance, and they won a plurality or ran about even with voters who were somewhat disappointed in the economy. Usually the party in power loses those voters overwhelmingly, okay? But those voters who were somewhat disenchanted with Biden still voted Democrat because they viewed the Trump era Republican party as a threat to democracy or a threat to their values or both. And that, if you look at the NBC Wall Street Journal poll that just came out, uh, I'm sorry, now it's just the NBC poll, which is done by Bill McInturf and Peter Hart's companies, the, you know, maybe the best Democratic pollster and the best Republican pollster, or vice versa. Um, Biden, again, was beating Trump among voters who somewhat disapproved of Biden, right? Like, I think, if I remember this correctly, 85% of voters who somewhat disapproved of Obama voted against him. And like 90% of voters who somewhat disapproved of Trump in 2020 voted against him. But Biden was winning that, as Democrats did in 22. Oh. That's the reason they're not jumping off a building. Well, let's talk then about the campaign issues that are emerging and how important a role they seem to be playing. Because mm -hmm. you've got a Republican field that it, they don't seem to be running specifically against Biden. They're running against woke. Yeah. And woke is a, a code word for so many things, including perhaps Kamala Harris. Um, you just wrote in the Atlantic that there's a sense among Republicans, a majority, that racism is over. It's not a problem for people of color anymore, not for women, not for minorities. And the real victims are GOP Us. constituencies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, look, I believe that the fund, you know, I wrote in 2012, and it's certainly more true, I think, today than when I wrote it, 
that the fundamental fault line in American politics are between the people in places that are comfortable with the way the country is changing demographically, culturally, and economically, and those who are uncomfortable or fear they are being marginalized by these changes. And that each coalition and I, is now fundamentally held together by values, not by interests, right? More by culture than by class. And I call this in 2012, the Democratic Coalition of Transformation and the Republican Coalition of Restoration. And I think virtually every fight we have, except for this small group of about 10% of voters who don't really align with either of these coalitions, um, every fight we have is about finding ways to activate that remind people which side of that divide they they fall on you know the, the 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 resistance or hostility to a changing america is the fundamental glue of the modern republican party it is no longer the reaganite trinity reaganite trinity of strong national defense uh, lower taxes less government um it is much more about uh, res you know, standing up against what they have now termed wokeism. So just a few numbers to give you a sense of how overwhelming this consensus is in the Republican Party. 90% of Trump voters say Christianity in America is under attack. Um, 70 to 75% of Republican voters say discrimination against whites is now a big, a big a problem as bias against minorities. 70% say the growing number of immigrants are undermining traditional American culture. And over 60% of Republican voters say that um, society now punishes men just for acting like men. And sometimes as high as 70% say white men are now the most discriminated against group in society. Um, and all of these beliefs overlap, like um, uh, uh, Tressa Undum, who is not well known, but is a fabulous pollster. Her company, Undum Perry, does a lot of really in-depth uh, research. And I think what they found in 2020 was the best predictor of support for building Trump's border wall was opposition to Black Lives Matter, not even attitudes about immigration. And abortion is the same thing. I mean, like, uh, you know, if you look at who supports and who opposes legal abortion, their views about gender roles, about racial change, about uh, more visibility for LGBTQ communities, all of these, all the cherries on the slot machine line up. You know, we could, we could say we have like the unibrow now of political issues where um, now there are still, you know, eight, 10% of the voters who don't really enlist with either side in this fight. And they are voters who may vote more on current conditions and how they feel uh, about the economy. But even that is, is, is mitigated by all of this. I mean, Democrats won independence in the national exit poll in 2022. No party holding the White House had done that since I believe going back all the way to 1982. Now, how did they do that? Because those voters, too, were more likely to see the Republicans uh, as extreme. Um, so all of this, all of this kind of leaves us in a place that is very much trench warfare. It's hard to move the electorate very much. It's hard to move states. There are only 40 states that voted the same way in the past four presidential elections, which is a higher share of states voting the same way than even in the four consecutive elections FDR won. There might be as few as four genuine swing states uh, in 2024, Which despite, um, I would say, I was gonna say, despite that poll, I don't really think Michigan and Pennsylvania will be in reach for Republicans if Trump is, especially if Trump is the nominee, maybe Pennsylvania with DeSantis, but not Michigan and probably not Pennsylvania. The four are Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, um, and Wisconsin. You know, mm -hmm. maybe North Carolina with now that the state Republican controlled legislature has banned abortion. Maybe Democrats can contest North Carolina by saying to voters, the only way to get your abortion rights back is by electing us to pass a national law. But probably not. I mean, like it, it would, if it was Trump versus Biden, it would not shock me if Trump won Georgia, maybe and nothing else changed. Or or Biden won North Carolina and nothing else changed. I mean, like. So we are dug in. Oh, so we're talking about, you mentioned specifically young people who were not excited about Biden, but there are two issues that may get 
a bigger Democratic turnout and a bigger, younger voter turnout too, which is guns, as we've seen campaigns against gun violence in schools, and abortion. Yeah. As this generation of, of young people begins to realize the implications for them of a world without Roe versus Wade in many states. So and in, fact, that... in fact, despite the low approval for Biden, youth turnout was substantial in 2022. It was not as high as the absolute peak in 2018, but it was higher than any other recent midterm. And the firm, another place I would commend to people to look is this, is this um, firm Catalyst, which is a democratic targeting firm that collects data on voters. And they do these very well-respected reports in both, respected in both parties after the fa after action kind of reports about the election, trying to ascertain what happened. And they found that in the states with the competitive statewide races, the turnout among millennials and Gen Z was even higher than it was in 2018, mm -hmm. which I think shocked a lot of people, given the expectation that it would be down because of their, their uh, you know, kind of uh, very mixed views on Biden. What, whatever happens, first of all, whatever happens to turnout, Gen Z is going to be a much bigger force in the election in 2024 than they were in 2020, because so many more of them will be eligible to vote. OK, I mean, the turnout is the numerator, the EVP, the eligible voter pool is the denominator. And even if the numerator doesn't go up, the EVP is going up a lot. Um, the projections are that, in fact, uh, by Bill Fry and others, that the biggest change in the electorate by far from 20 to 24 is that Gen Z will comprise about five percentage points more of the actual voting pool than they did in 2020. That would be about 8 million more people. Wow. Okay? Yeah, no, that is a wow. And further, it, it is highly likely that Gen Z and millennials combined, people born since 1980, will cast as many votes as those born before 64, which are the baby boomers and the last silence. This, that will be the first time ever that people born after 90, this, this election will likely be the first time ever people born after 1980 will cast as many votes as people born below, before 64. By the way, all you Gen Xers who feel that you always get overlooked in these conversations, you'll be about 25% of the vote. That has stayed remarkably constant. It will stay constant over the next several cycles. But after this election, it's virtually guaranteed, after this election, uh, Gen, uh, Gen Z and millennials will probably rise to over 40% of the vote by 28, and the um, uh, and the the older 64 and older uh, will shrink uh, to uh, you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 32, 31. So like okay, so the Gen Z point. they'll be scattering rose petals in front of them on the way to the polls. This is the tipping point. I mean, this is the tipping point election, and you know like I you know I DeSantis, I think DeSantis, who's probably the only other Republican who can win the nomination creates a different set of circumstances. But if you think about most of the objective thing, most of the concrete things that have happened since, ele like, uh, since election day in 2020, right? Donald Trump lost by seven and a half million votes, right? And then, then what's happened? You know, we had the January 6th insurrection. He got impeached again. He's been indicted multiple times. He lost a civil judgment um, uh, for sexual uh, abuse, which is really sexual assault under New York law. And the only real change in the electorate are the non-college whites you depend on are gonna shrink two points. And the Gen Z that have a 25%, 30% approval rating of him uh, are gonna be up 5 million. It's hard for me to see how Trump who didn't have enough last time can really get over the top this time with the possibility that if there is a more overt health problem for Biden or the economy tumbles into recession, maybe that that is enough to change the dynamic. But most things that have happened would lead you to believe that his ceiling is slightly lower, not vastly lower, maybe not as low as it should be given everything that's happened, but at least slightly lower. And he didn't have enough last time. OK, so we have the actuarial table element of politics, yes, we do. national politics. But there's something else that, that entered the mix this week with the Supreme Court, which surprised and pleased uh, people who hadn't expected it, which that had voted against this independent state legislative yeah. theory, that Republican legislatures were in many cases, and now North Carolina is the one that led the way to the Supreme Court, said, 
we can do whatever we want with election results. The courts have no control over us. We can even defy what the numbers show from voters. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't. This means some redistricting is going to be redone. This means mm -hmm. that uh, the high handedness in some Republican legislatures is not going to work. What impact is that going to have in 2024? Uh, you know, it's like it's like saying we're not going to have a head on collision. You know, um, uh, it, 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 the, let's be clear. John Roberts, going back to his time in the Reagan Justice Department, has had a lifetime uh, crusade to weaken and roll back federal uh, oversight of voting rights, a federal guarantee of voting rights. And we're now in the 10th anniversary of the Shelby County decision which uh, he wrote uh, in 2013 uh, and eviscerated the preclearance in, of the Voting Rights Act. And that has changed America fundamentally. I mean, the, 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 the amount of activity, closing polling places, laws making it tougher to vote, purging voting rolls that has happened in red states that would have been barred by the Justice Department under this is, is almost incalculable. So, and, you know, ruling that the courts cannot um, uh, uh, federal courts cannot um, challenge partisan redistricting, weakening the other voting rights. Voting rights. There's been a long history of of this, but this was a bridge too far. Just like the Texas-led challenge of the 2020 election was a bridge too far. I mean, they will go. The Republican-appointed majority on the court will go a long way toward echoing Republican beliefs that states should have more freedom to set their election rules and the federal role should be circumscribed wherever possible, but they will not, they're not Thelma and Louise here. They're not gonna drive into the canyon. Uh, and they kind of, you know, they put the brakes on the car here. They, they, were, they were not willing to, to, to put down a ruling that was both just so, you know, transparently uh, unjustified, but also would have produced such chaos and such social strife. I mean, it was opening the door, as you said, for you know, legislature, a state like Georgia, you know, where uh, Biden, you know, there aren't that many states that Biden could win where Republicans control the legislature, but Georgia and Arizona, say, are two of them, and uh, Wisconsin is another. Um, you know, you if you would have ruled the other way, you practically would be inviting them to toss out the the results. And then what happens? Like I've always, I always thought that Pat, that was the the big flaw in the thinking of all of the Trump and, and Ken Paxton and all those who are trying to overturn the 2020 result. Like, did they think Blue America was just gonna say, well played, you got us, you know, you outmaneuvered us. I guess we have to submit to this. Like who knows what would have happened if the election was overtly stolen? Who knows what will happen if there are attempts to overtly steal the election? I don't presume that the cohesion of the country is guaranteed under any scenario. Like, I think there are scenarios where all sorts of things, I don't know exactly how it would be expressed, but I don't see Gavin Newsom and J.B. Pritzker and Katie Hobbs and Tony Evers and Tim Waltz and all the other, and Wes Moore, just basically saying, okay, if the House or the Supreme Court tries to steal the election again in 24, I, I, don't, don't assume this ends well. If if uh, if if that if that actually unfolds, Ron, let's get to some questions from yeah, people who are watching. Um, let's see. Uh, there was one I wanted to be sure to tell you from. Let's find it here. From Ruth, where is Ruth's question? Uh, I'm sorry, it's just scrolling up through these. I understand a little bit. Um. We'll, we'll find her in a, a minute. Here we go. Karen says, what about the impact of the no labels party, which we talked about RFK Jr. as a possible spoiler. This says, look, we're not aligned with everybody. And a lot of Americans, especially in California, regard themselves as independent of party voters. And so anyone who says we're not a party may get votes with an agenda that isn't exactly what the voters expected of them. Um, I think that the results of 18, 20, and 22 leave no doubt that there is an anti-Trump majority in the country. Um, there are, again, based on the data from Catalyst, there are 93 million separate human beings, separate individuals who came out to vote against Trumpism in, in, in over those three elections. 
right? So it's not 93 million total votes, 93 million total people have voted against Trump one way or the other um, over these last three elections. So in a head to head, um, you know, uh, matchup absent a complete physical, as I said, or economic collapse, I think there, there's a majority of the country does not wanna live under the vision of America that Trump's put forward. The biggest risk to Biden against Trump is that that majority is splintered and a meaningful portion of it, as in 2016, kind of drifts away to third party alternatives because they don't really like Biden either. And that would be especially true among young people. So I think there it is unequivocal that no labels getting on the ballot in swing states would make it more likely for Trump to win in a Biden-Trump matchup. Uh, here's what I was looking for from Ruth. Please tell Mr. Brownstein I'm a real groupie. I think he's wonderful, so insightful, articulate, and always on the money. Congratulations, Ron. Thank you. Uh, ah. a, a lot of people, Robert and Barbara among them, are wondering about the Republican field in the primary, what his base would do if he doesn't win the nomination, or if there's any real, where would you put the plausible odds of him not getting the nomination, given that the indictments don't seem to have chipped away too much of his, his base right. or maybe even some Republican swing voters. Right. So a couple of points on this. First, in terms of the indictments, the core message, Trump's core message, right, is that all of these changes in America are meant, are, is the left and the elites um, trying to tear up, uproot the America that you have known and that you value and they are designed and I and I am all that stands between you and them. I am, as Robert Jones once said to me, the human wall. He is like the human equivalent of his border wall protecting these groups that are in fact shrinking in society. White Christians are down to 42% of the country. Non-college whites are down to 40% of the electorate. Um, and Trump his core message, again, Coalition of Restoration, is that I alone, as he said in 2016, can protect you against all of these forces that are looking to marginalize and displace you. And so it doesn't surprise me that he's been able to convince them that all of these indictments are uh, just another manifestation of this vast a conspiracy so vast to transform America and, and take it away from the, quote, real Americans and, and give it to these you know, godless, cross-dressing, big city liberals. Um, uh, so, um, and in addition to that, the fact that the other candidates have chosen to amplify his narrative that he is the victim of the deep state rather than go the way that Mark Esper, Bill Barr, John Bolton, and even Pompeo a little bit have cleared for them and saying, now, wait a minute, you know, I don't love the Justice Department either, but like, this is not the behavior we, that, that really we want to see in our next president. They won't even do that. So right now, they are, he is in a very commanding position. I mean, the basic construct of the race looks like 2016 only a little better. In 2016, when you looked at all the exit polls of all the, uh, all the contests, Trump won just under half of Republicans without a college degree, and he won only a third of the Republicans with a degree. And he was able to win because the other two thirds of Republicans, uh, splint, college Republicans splintered, they never unified behind one, uh, uh, one alternative. Now, here we are eight years later, and because Trump has driven away so many white collar suburban voters, including some maybe on this call, um, the Republican electorate is probably gonna be even more tilted toward the non-college whites than it was in 16, parenthetically, even as the overall electorate gets less tilted toward those voters. So they're going to be even more of the voters who prefer Trump. And while he's still stuck at around one third of the college Republicans, he's now up to 55 or 60 percent of the non-college Republicans, which is an insane number in a crowded field. There's no way anybody's going to beat him if he stays anywhere near that. Um, and so DeSantis looked like he was more capable of, of unifying the party uh, the parts of the party that don't want Trump than the candidates in 16, he's been shrinking. The only silver lining I would point out for DeSantis is Trump has not succeeded in disqualifying him to Republican voters. His favorables are as high as Trump's. Trump voters see no reason to get, get off of Trump, go to someone else. But if they do, Trump hasn't convinced them that DeSantis is not a viable alternative. All right. So what's in the water in Florida besides alligators? Because you've got Trump 
running. You got DeSantis, who's now talked about uh, overturning the Constitution, evidently unilaterally thinks he can, that people who are born here are not citizens, take action to end the idea that children of illegal aliens are entitled to birthright citizenship, which, as you point out, Bob Dole in 1996 rejected. Now, uh, Rick Scott, the senator, former governor, warning socialists and communists don't even think of vacationing in Florida. And the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, whose biggest distinguishing mark so far has been in an interview with conservative radio host Hugh Hewitt, who asked him about the fate of the Uyghurs. He said, what's a Uyghur? And then he later said, well, I didn't understand his pronunciation. Of course, I know what Uyghurs are. So Florida has maybe four presidential candidates in the Republican field. Yeah, well, we don't know if, if Scott will actually uh, do it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's kind of like the Florida man meme coming to uh, coming to national politics. Um, maybe we should ask Carl Hyacin or you know Dave Barry probably could give you a better answer than I. But it is it is telling. I mean, look, I mean the the coalition of restoration, as I call it, uh, which includes a significant number of conservative, culturally conservative uh, Latino voters and Hispanic voters, especially in Florida, but not at, by any means exclusively in Florida. Um, it feels increasingly aggrieved and it's increasingly open to uh, rhetoric and positions that would have seemed radical not long ago. I mean, I, I'm sure if we polled, I haven't seen a poll on this, but I'm guessing 75% of Republicans support ending birthright citizenship at this point. Um, uh, and again, over 70% of them say the growing number of immigrants are a threat to U.S. traditions uh, and values. This after the decade in which we had the second slowest population growth of any decade in U.S. history except the Depression, and we don't have enough workers, which is one of the reasons why the Fed is keeping interest rates high, so we're all paying a price for not having enough immigrants, but let's leave that aside. Um, you know, Trump is, I think Trump has moved all of this forward. He's crystallized it, he's accelerated it, but he didn't create it. I mean, you have a substantial block of the country that feels fundamentally aggrieved from the way the country is changing on a lot of different fronts. Uh, and they are open and even demanding of more radicalized responses to that than we would have, certainly we saw, you know, when they nominated Romney, McCain, Bush, and Dole. I mean, this is not that party. Yeah. This is a party in which the principal uh, hurdle you have to cross is convincing voters that you are committed to fighting against all the forces that they feel are marginalizing them. And that's why, I mean, if you look at DeSantis and Trump, they combine for something like 75% of the Republican primary vote pretty consistently, you know, and Trump and DeSantis is essentially offering Trumpism without Trump. So I kind of go back to where I started, you know, 75% of the Republican party is basically in this mold. Now, there are a lot of formerly Republican leading independents who voted for Biden and voted for Democrats in 22. And that's how Gretchen Whitmer won by 12 points. I mean, Oakland County, Michigan, and you know, Cobb and Gwinnett outside of Atlanta, Montgomery and Delaware uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Maricopa. I mean, these places are becoming more democratic as the GOP becomes uh, Trumpier, but within the coalition itself, all those Florida man candidates are pretty much what they want. You mentioned something I found interesting, which is the Republicans, in spite of their anti-immigrant rhetoric, are courting immigrant populations like Latino populations, Muslim populations, uh, on the basis of their social agenda. I mean, do you really expect that there's going to be a big harvest of votes against drag queens? Um, well, only in the sense, yes. Short answer is yes. In only in the sense, and but a big harvest of votes anti-anti-drag queen. Like, I don't, you know, abortion maybe is an exception to what I'm about to say, but I'm not even sure that's an exception. I don't really think any of these, there is, I don't believe in single issues by and large. I believe- Not even guns and abortion? Which not even guns and abortion, because I think, first of all, they overlap overwhelmingly. I believe people look at each of these issues and develop a vision of which team they belong on, which side shares their fundamental values. You know, I wrote columns when I was still at the LA Times after, and 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 so, and even when I went to the Atlantic, um, really, I wrote columns from 20, from 2000 to 2012 about gun control. And 
I wrote after Al Gore lost in 2000 with the NRA making a big effort against him and he lost Tennessee and he lost New Hampshire. Democrats went silent on gun controls for over, for over a decade out of fear of losing more blue collar, non-urban white voters who oppose gun control. And what I wrote over that entire decade was that the voters they're afraid of losing, they've already lost. They've lost them on 10 other things beside guns that also reflect kind of the culture. They lost them on climate change. They lost them on immigration. They lost them on all these issues that reflect the cultural uh, positioning in many ways of, of the parties. Uh, and by not emphasizing guns, they were failing to do all they could to win over what were then still Republican leaning white collar uh, yeah. suburbs. And, you know, when Obama started after Sandy Hook, but certainly Clinton in 2016 and, and Biden even more in, in 2020, um, all of these things kind of line up now. So yeah, Republicans are, they've established a new higher floor with Latino voters. I mean, it didn't get worse in 2022, which was good for Democrats in the sense that the economy was so bad and it didn't get worse, but it didn't get better. You know, there's probably now somewhere around 36, 38%, maybe 40, if it gets bad, of Latinos who are going to vote Republican uh, for, Ron, for Democrats. So I, I want kind of a TV short answer to yes. this as we're getting close to wrapping up from Woody. Yeah. Do you think Americans' sour view of the economy is partly due to the media's negative bias about economic news, which is to say that the negative is the newsworthy stuff? There was so much coverage of high gas prices and so little coverage of falling gas prices, as an example. I think it's when I don't think inflation is that driven by it's something you everybody lives every day. I think it's it's how much money they have left at the end of the week, much more than media coverage. So even though some things are getting better, people are feeling that the things that are not getting better are closest to their own pocketbooks. Yeah. yeah. And also, like inflation isn't going up as fast, but that doesn't mean prices are going down. You know, I mean, they're, they're not still going up. And gas prices have gone, you know, they go back and forth, but they've gone down. I think it's the grocery, for, I mean, it's that, it, it's the prices that inflation, we haven't had many examples of, 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 of large scale long-term inflation, but it's been really politically disruptive. Certainly from 1979 through 1982, it drove a lot of US politics. And I think it's gonna be hard for Biden to get a huge amount of credit for the other things that are going really well in particular, employment and this investment agenda, which is having enormous effect. And and you know, people feel the, the prices squeezing Republican them. Republican politicians are out there saying, look at this great bridge we're building, look at this great high-speed internet, when in fact they voted against this. So, yeah. so let yeah. me ask you, we try to end on something a little positive. And I was thinking of, of the candy commercial that's out there now, which begins, Americans have never been so divided. And I think it asks you to choose between red and black licorice. So mm. you know, even to candy tastes, we're, we're divided. Yes. Is there something hopeful and positive that you think we can look for and that may get bigger and more significant in its influence? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to the view that America today is California in the 90s. Uh, California in the 90s, as we were becoming uh, a majority minority state, right? Whites were falling below a majority of the population. We, the state had kind of a spasm a backlash, a, a whole series of Pop 187 in '94 banning, uh, you know, the 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 the, uh, the immigration uh, uh, initiative, uh, banning affirmative action, banning bilingual education, three strikes, just a whole series of way and and, and increased tension between uh, not only whites and non-whites but, but but black communities and Latino communities. Um, there are still tensions in in California as a society, but you know what? The the tipping point came. Society became major no single majority group, um, a majority non-white, sky didn't fall, life went on. And with the exception of what we've seen in the LA City Council, by and large, politics are less toxic along racial lines than they were 25 years ago. I know if you agree, 30 years ago in the state, I certainly think so. Um, maybe that's what's happening in America, that this is the moment of maximum tension. But you know what? More Americans have now been born after 1980. A majority of the country, Pat, has now been born since 1980. Each generation born since 1980 is more diverse than the last. 45% of millennials are people of color, like 49% of Gen Z, a majority of whatever we're calling after Gen Z, Gen Alpha. Um, and that suggests to me that there's going to become a point probably in the 2030s when all of this calms down. 
Thank you. Uh, you recognized the rap signal and you did it absolutely perfectly. Ron Brownstein, thank you. Look forward to the next time you're back here to give us some insight and analysis and your especially useful advice about how to gauge what's really a poll and what just calls itself a poll. Ron, Ron thanks as always. Thanks for having me. A reminder that next week I'm going to be talking to Rick Hassan, the uh, political and elections guru at UCLA. That's next Wednesday. Hope you'll join us for that and for all the programs coming up over this summer. I'm Pat Morrison. Thank you all for joining us.